Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. On this fast forward planet, a very soggy planet in places right now, um, with urgent flooding still happening in Zhengzhou, China, some of the scenes there are surreal, as they were from parts of Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium just uh, a week ago. And um, we've had these insane heat heat waves, heat domes uh, in places that are not attuned to heat, like the Pacific Northwest. And the world is struggling with several fronts at the same time. One is vulnerability that's been built to these kinds of hazards. And the other is the fact that the system is changing and we're a big jolt to the system through the now resurging emissions of carbon dioxide after the pandemic great pause, that, that's history. Uh, we are living in civilizations that are really dependent on energy. And for now, the uh, choices are still predominantly from fossil fuels. I'm Andy Revkin at the Earth Institute of Columbia University in the Climate School. And um, this is the Sustain What webcast that tries to foster some progress toward uh, more resilient outcomes, more resilient uh, possibilities for our planet going forward. I see Colin Doyle is joining us too, and, and uh, I'll get to you in a second, Colin. Uh, it's great that you could come as well. Um, we're going to have a discussion about flood vulnerability, particularly Focus on a couple of reports. Uh, CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, recently uh, did a report on cities and climate vulnerability assessments. How are you know our cities adequately? Looking at their vulnerabilities, uh, recently there was a new study that came out from another uh, group that showed in Germany, for example, after the climate emergency declarations were spreading, there was a lot of uh, rush to cl climate impact assessments, but mostly it's about our impact on the climate, uh, cutting emissions, uh, what can cities do to uh, cut their carbon footprints. Most of those plans so far don't include a real fresh look at vulnerability. And just looking at, at uh, Blessem, one place in Germany, uh, which has had a devastating impact. You see uh, a lot of that had to do with the vulnerability that was built, um, including having a sand and gravel pit in essentially in a river basin uh, uh, next to uh, a town. It's not a good idea. So today's guests are uh, Katie Walsh, who's with CDP. She's the head of cities for states and regions for CDP North America. And again, these issues transcend continental boundaries. I'll show you a video from Vermont from 1927 to give you a sense of what can happen here too. Um, and as I said, they've recently put out a report on uh, cities and vulnerability reduction. Uh, Manu, uh, Manu Lal, who's the director of the Columbia Water Center, uh, which is the home to a global floods initiative as well, is with us. And no one I know knows more about flooding and risk uh, and the added in, uh, issue of dams around the world that uh, many of which are in disrepair and pose, uh, pose other risks. And Max Ricker, who's a, at the Nature Conservancy based in Berlin, which as we were just saying, like literally a week or two before Germany's uh, disastrous floods had put out a report on the importance of thinking about giving space to rivers uh, and using uh, green infrastructure, essentially, uh, nature-based solutions is the term these days, to um, make sure that we have lower odds of these kinds of calamities when water when rivers try to be what they are what they are <laughs> and, and humans are too close by. So it's great to have you all here. And again, Colin Doyle will be with us in a minute. Um, it will uh, start to discuss some of these questions. Um, first of all, how, all, how are you all doing? Uh, let's just start with uh, start with Max because you're closest to the most recent uh, episode. You're in Berlin, uh, G Germany, you know, in the United States, we think of Europe as these small little places, but Germany itself is big. So not, you know, when there's extreme flooding in, in uh, that Rhineland area, it's not necessarily affecting you. But what was it like as you saw this unfold right after having written this report? Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. Um, it, was, it was pretty uncanny timing. I mean, we'd been thinking about this for a better part of last year as we were writing this report between the research behind it. And we've seen the past few years, a series of dramatic events in other parts like Greece and Spain. And after we relaunched this report, after we launched this report, a week and a half, two weeks afterwards, this really big storm was predicted 
to come across the northwestern part of Europe and it dumped a torrential amount of rain that, that led it faster we all saw. And it's been really tragic hearing different anecdotes of, of people who have suffered through that. And unfortunately, I think this is just the start of probably what's a more and more common story if we if we continue not to think about how we adapt to climate change and if we continue on our current trajectory of emissions. Uh, that's for sure. And could could you maybe run through what's the key lesson here? I mean, the picture you show here in the, in the report gives this reality that proximity to rivers is a big part of what many cities, their whole history. They, the reason the city exists is because often because of its location uh, by a waterway. Sure. I mean, water is the basis of life and historically it's the basis of trade as well. And we, we do tend to settle around waterways. And moving forward, we need to think about what's our relationship with those waterways and how much room do we give to them to exist in the natural way, as you said before, as rivers. And the question isn't just how do we develop the areas around rivers, it's what do we do in the landscape and the watershed? How much area do we leave for nature to, one, slow the flow of water into those rivers? and two, to actually just absorb some of that water or when there's events to, to allow some space for excess water to flow into it and sit and just kind of wait out the storm. Right. And how, uh, I, I wanna flip to Katie uh, because you've just done an analysis of cities and vulnerability, uh, your group, and how are we doing on this? <laughs> this question, yeah. Are cities adequately attuned to these well, thanks. Yeah. Also, thanks. Thanks for having us, and and thanks for having um, CDP, and and to be able to talk about some of our findings. I, um, I'm here in CDP North America in our New York office. Uh, I am. I'm in Brooklyn. I'm. I'm born and raised. You know, Bro Brooklynite, and I. Uh, my experience yesterday walking walking outside of my house is that we here in New York City were feeling the fires from the West Coast and the air quality was so bad that they were recommending people with asthma like myself um, and unhealthy populations, um, you know, prevent, try and limit their time outside, um, wear a mask, right? So, so our mask has multiple purposes. And those are the fires from the West Coast and we're here feeling it here in New York City. And so we are, we are feeling, we are breathing, um, we are experiencing the impacts of climate change. They are there with us, um, and my heart goes out to to everyone um, across the globe that is is going through um, these challenges. We, uh, you know, here again, um, just the, the New York context, and and also thinking about you know where I live, the the communities that are most impacted, um, most vulnerable, uh, historically marginalized communities. Um, uh, you know, working class, black and brown communities here in the United States um, that were already heavily impacted by COVID, um, that were already more vulnerable. We we are living in an environmental, I'm in an environmental justice um, community that again has a lot of environmental burdens um, and are already at risk. Um, and now you layer on all of these impacts um, that are that are coming in real time. So it, this is a major concern. We need cities to be acting as quickly as possible. The CDP cities research that was released in May of this past year, um, the, the road to 2030, looked specifically at the disclosure from 800 cities. So CDP is a global environmental disclosure platform for companies, for states and regions, and for cities around the world. And we work with them because if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And so the environmental disclosure platform is a tool to go through and understand and be accountable both to where you need to go for ambition um, and understand uh, your individual responsibility, um, but also being able to, again, take this individual action through measurement. So we had cities who are um, reporting from the United States, from Canada, globally, over 800 cities. Uh, we found that the cities who we have, uh, over 90% of our cities globally are reporting climate risk. Of those, right, so they, they see mm -hmm. climate risk, climate change is a huge impact. 40% of them have actually developed climate risk and vulnerability assessments. Right or forty percent. I'm sorry. Don't have don't have climate right. risk 
vulnerability assessments. And so what is that, you know, what does that tell you? Vulnerability assessment is a tool to be able to figure out what actions you need to take. And so again, it really underlines the importance of going through this measurement process, understanding what your risks are so that you can start to take to take action. Yeah, and this, uh, how much do you think has been integrated in the sense of vulnerability of to climate change as opposed to vulnerability, the general question of liability and uh, the, this, these vulnerability issues don't seem to be well recognized yet. And I don't know whether in the assessments that are done, like for just to, for flooding, are cities realistic about understanding how exposed they are? Some of the challenges that cities have is is understanding what you know they 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 understand their short term risks, but how is the environment changing over time? What are those medium and long term risks going to look like? And so again, that's the purpose of going through vulnerability assessment, being able to have real scientific tools, being able to understand how. Uh, the climate is changing. How does this influence so that you can start to make some of those projections? But what we what we're working with is is again, you know, the the 800 cities that are going through this process. Um, but if I think about here in the United States, right, we had 165 cities in the U.S. Um, but what about the 30 34 thousand other municipalities in the U.S. that right. really should be going through this you know this exercise um, of cataloging, measurement, and understanding how climate will impact them over time. And um, I'm going to bring in Colin. Just uh, here, here's Colin Doyle, who's uh, from Cloud to Street, and is a researcher looking at um, flooding vulnerability and patterns around the world. Colin, you, I, I want to be sure I don't jump the gun on stuff that's embargoed and coming out in a paper shortly. But w w you have done a lot of work on what's possible in terms of mapping people. How many people and and assets are in harm's way and What's the thumbnail sketch of what you could say uh, right now? You, you, you know, not uh, honoring what's uh, what's under embargo. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so at Cloud Street, we've done a lot of work with um, using uh, remote sensing observations to try to look at actual flood extents. And so getting to this point of <clears throat> excuse me, doing flood vulnerability, um, what we found is well, that's a very hard thing to do. Um, in, in reality, and so a general approach is to use like flood modeling. Um, although what we have found is that uh, it's really hard to make a good flood model that's actually accurate. And when you start looking at um, actual observations, uh, there ends up being a lot of people not accounted for that are in fact um, in harm's way. Uh, and that reminds so me. That reminds me of when you think about loss, me measurement of loss. Right, we're only measuring insured loss often, and not you, you know informal settlements. Exactly. The, the people so who are not on the record, you know, how do you account for that? But anyway, back to you. Yeah, I, I believe that actually globally, um, it's estimated about 70% of um, lost assets due to flooding is not insured. Um, but in this study that uh, that will be coming out very soon is uh, bottom line, basically, is that we found that there's about uh, 50 to 80 million people that have um, been uh, additional people that have been exposed to floods in the last 15 years purely due, due to population growth within known floodplains. So places where we have observed real flooding happening in the last 20 years, we're having tens of millions of people uh, move into these places um, just over the last two decades. Um, so even without taking into account climate change, um, as we mentioned before, people like to live near rivers. Um, right. And while there's a lot of advantages economically um, to that, uh, there's also a lot of risk to it. Um, and it's really important kind of how you work with with uh, the river and the, the natural pulses. Yeah, well, I get to that, the justice issue that Katie mentioned, in other words, uh, outsized vulnerability. If you really map and zoom in, you see that vulnerabilities are often uh, socioeconomic, whether it's heat or flood loss or the like. Uh, Manu, uh, you've been very patient and I'd love to get your Thanks, global perspective in here. You, you know, when you've seen the recent uh, disasters and I could show the footage just out of, um, Shengzhou of people, I think about 13 people died in a, in a subway car that as it was progressively flooded. Um, astonishing downpours, astonishing exposure to hazard. You know, China's history of flooding is as old as China. Um, but what do we do? So Manu, over to you just briefly, and then we'll, we'll start to talk about where do we go from here? And sure. I'll show a little bit more data. 
Yeah, again, thanks for uh, asking me to join today. I, I think I'm going to take a slightly different tack than what I've heard so far, um, more in line with you know, what we were talking about before. Um, there's climate and there's climate change. And climate has always been with us with all its nuances. And as a result, we've always had floods. And the question is, where are we with regard to the flooding situation today in the world? And the answer to that is that in the period around the Second World War, before and after, uh, as a society, we had a lot of investment in flood control. And you know, Max will argue that that was all bad because we put in hard infrastructure to control floods instead of green infrastructure. Don't care. Something was done. Since then, we've been sleeping, basically. If you look at investment in any kind of measures for flood control, it's been non-existent for the last 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. The last dams that were built in the United States, which were of any consequence whatsoever, were 1976. So, you know, we've been sleeping. And most of those things are old now and are doomed to failure. Uh, and at the same time, we have gone from, in the 1960s, People were concerned that we had 4 billion people, and now we are sitting at you know double that. Uh, so the exposure grows, but because there's different ways that the exposure grows, it grows because there are more people who are living more near uh, water bodies, but it's also because we increase, irrespective of anything else, we increase the total paved area because all these people need, need places to live in. So the water cycle then on land irrespective of what we do with climate change accelerates as well, which contributes to increased flooding. So what should we be doing now? We can do green infrastructure, we can move people out of there. None of these are going to happen very easily. We mm. really, the thing that I think is interesting and useful with what's been going on is suddenly floods are in the news and people are saying, what do I have to do about it? When the flood goes away, somebody comes in, looks at the beautiful landscape and builds a house on it. Uh, and, or a business on it. This is, you know, because it's romantic uh, in their view. They, they want the view. Uh, right. That's one dimension. The other dimension is poor people who have nowhere else to go end up on these vulnerable slopes, um, and uh, you know they're flooded basically. So seriously, what we need to be doing is continue talking about climate change and what we do need to do to mitigate it but face up to climate risk and what we need to do to solve these things in everyday life. We are not doing that. We are so hung up on we need to decarbonize and reduce those things, all of which is good, that we are not paying attention to the impacts of climate that are always with us. Yeah, this is an issue that's come up repeatedly on my broadcasts. Um, uh, Diana Liverman, uh, just a couple of weeks ago from our University of Arizona, we were talking about heat, but she was saying, you know, people continue to mix up climate risk and climate change. Climate change is one driver of risk and risk is a function of how many people, how vulnerable they are uh, and the hazard and if it's changing. So maybe back to Max again in that sense, uh, uh, is, is that full picture sinking in when you think about the discussion in Germany and we'll go to Katie again too, uh, or is it seems, in situations like this, and here I am writing about climate change for 33 years, climate change, meaning global warming, this, um, it seems that we have a hard time backing away to the bigger picture when the world is so, you know, when it seems so urgent to try to get people to start decarbonizing. At the same time, we have to cut risk on the ground in places that are vulnerable. I, I don't know whether those messages are we just too immature as a species or communities or the media or uh, leadership to be able to do two things at once? Well, I can't answer if we're too immature or not, but I would, <laughs> I would definitely say we can and we should continue to prioritize decarbonization. That's, that's what's going to stem this as much as possible. But even if we but do on a long time scale, sorry. But on a very long time scale, in other words, yes, it takes time for that to register in the climate system. Certainly. And so you know, the next point is, even if we do reach the 1.5 degree target, so limiting our emissions to that point, that's still a warmer world than today. And that means we will still have more frequent natural disasters than we're currently seeing. And so to ignore adaptation is, 
is very short-sighted. Yeah. And I think it's really critical that we as a society collectively start thinking about this as a dual challenge. And from the point of a nature conservancy, I would say that a three-way challenge because we're also facing a crisis of biodiversity collapse. And so that's where we say nature here has a critical role to play in both mitigation through capturing carbon in certain landscapes and, and types of ecosystems, and also an adaptation through a number of things. We can get into that later about what the role of nature is in rivers. But thirdly, this is a key way to restore and protect some of the biodiversity that we're seeing rapidly disappear around the world. And so I think your point on toting more and more adaptation is critical. I mean, it's, it's really necessary to save ourselves in the short term as well. And, and Katie, um, just give, getting back to that justice question, um, that also doesn't seem to register sometimes, even when you see big adaptation plans. Like in New York City, I wrote back in the Bloomberg days of about the big U and all these, which is basically protecting Wall Street. But what are we doing to really get honest about the vulnerabilities that can be reduced now? Uh, this came up in a recent chat I did on heat too, where uh, heat is, you know, you die or live based on whether you have an air conditioner or a place to go. And so it's at that scale, what, what isn't being registered can be registered. Right. Well, you're you're only as strong as your your most um, you know vulnerable like populations, right? So, I mean, the the importance of integrating equity into the the work that is happening on climate action for cities that are leading the way on thinking about this holistically, um, equity is one of the pillars. Um, and working within uh, recognizing environmental justice harms, you know, historically marginalized communities, but then also being able to to have this integrated in the in the long term planning, the black here in the United States, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the the murder of George Floyd, um, really with the combination of COVID nineteen really exacerbating um, a lot of these challenges has thrust this conversation um, and really you know put it front and center. Um, we ha we have cities who have a legacy of doing this work. Um, City of Baltimore has been doing climate action and climate adaptation planning for a long time. And key to that has been a focus on equity. So we have some really good examples um, of, 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 again, how to center that work and re reorient what that that planning looks like. Um, I want to you know, kind of also respond to your your earlier question of, you know, where do we go from here and and what you know challenges that do we have ahead? Um, we have our science, um, the climate science is sort of right uh, in terms of resource and access, but then also um, being able to understand, you know, the impacts. Um, so in terms of, of understanding the, the science aspect of this, um, here, here, you know, the investor community um, and looking at the financial markets, there is, I will pull out one example from the uh, city of Buffalo, you know, just issued about two weeks ago, an environmental uh, impact bond. So that ties the infrastructure investment that they have to environmental outcomes um, in terms of what they can achieve. And it was oversubscribed and it's the largest environmental impact bond of its kind that has been issued in the United States in the city of Buffalo. Um, and so the investor market is is looking for these types of opportunities. Um, you have this new generation of uh, investors, millennials and women who do not want to invest in dirty projects. Um, and and the investor community is, is looking for opportunities. And so city climate adaptation plans, city decarbonization goals, you know, provide an opportunity, but being able to provide those projects and provide a map of those projects is so important. Um, we released last week a mm -hmm. snapshot of U.S. cities infrastructure projects across the United States from the, from the West to the Northeast that are seeking financing. Those could be a mix of, of um, how those how those uh, financial mechanisms you know work themselves out, but these projects range from green infrastructure projects to transportation projects, um, and it's very timely, of course, given that we are now kind of right in the middle of this debate on what infrastructure funding looks like. So right. our 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 opportunity then is is the political will and the policy. How do we use that to our advantage? And then how do we provide the additional capacity and support to overcome that? I, I talked earlier about, you know, 40, 
forty percent um, of the of the cities not having climate vulnerability assessments, and those are a critical step to figure out what actions you're going to take. So, how do we close that gap, and how do we support um, and accelerate action and do it at scale? Oh, by the way, with those cities, is there a pattern yet on where this has caught hold and where the gaps are? We have, um, it's, I mean, if you look across like the, the global gaps and then even how it plays out in, in the regions as well, um, you know, it, it, it plays out in the U.S. So we have, you know, just correspondingly 40% of our cities um, also not having climate adaptation vulnerability assessments here in the United States as well. Um, so you have uh, in best case scenarios, you know, when you have cities that have access to the tools and data um, that's available to them. Um, NOAA in the United States has done a lot, National Atmospheric um, Administration has done a lot to be able to provide these downscale climate science data tools, um, especially now that they are you know, available um, uh, and, and, and dispersing them in, in such an active way um, to be able to, to use that. But again, it, a lot of it then comes down to being able to apply it and support cities. So the, the limit here also comes back to budgetary capacity. Cities need to be able to right. have the resource to be able to do it. And they cite that in their disclosure, 25% of cities cite budgetary capacity oh. and limits as their ability to even pull these resources and, and climate vulnerability assessments together, um, which prevents, prevents further action. Uh, and Colin, uh, with your work again, you know, respecting the embargo of what's coming, but uh, is there a pattern where you see where where is the exposure sh surging most? My, in my experience in reporting, uh, you know, look to Sub-Saharan Africa, Lagos, Nigeria, or Nigeria in general. You know, by 2070, under current fertility, we're talking about Nigeria alone having 750 million people, just that one country. And uh, Lagos and cities like that are already, um, you know, bursting at the seams in many ways. So, so where, what generally, what general patterns you be uh, in the data? Uh, yeah, you you uh, hit the nail right on the right on the head. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, um, in parts of Asia, uh, are seeing dis disproportionately increased compared to other parts of the world um, in terms of flood exposure and. Um, I get back to Katie's point earlier about uh, inequality and equity and um, in adaptation and uh, these mitigation strategies in general um, and how marginalized people tend to get pushed to marginalized land um, no matter where you are. Um, and those are the people who have uh, less ability to, to adapt and recover. Um, and moreover, when cities are going to design, like how are we going to protect our assets from flood risk, usually their first thought is not like, where do people need the help the most? Their first thought is where are most expensive assets we want to protect? Um, and so it kind of self perpetuates. Um, and it's such an important uh, aspect to truly uh, adapt. Um, and actually a chief science officer uh, last year published a paper on in the US how um, extremely unequal uh, flood risk or um, the ability to recover from flood loss is just within the US. Well, I was I was wondering that when I was reporting on the Houston flooding of, under Harvey, um, again, people, this gets back to what I said earlier about insurance, you know, people who are renters, they don't have any recourse, they lose everything, and uh, they may not have lost their the value of the property, but they're, I, I don't know how many assessments have been done just generally, maybe that's one that you were just describing that kind of reinforced that idea that basic economic lack of capacity mm -hmm is your driver of flood vulnerability or any kind of disaster. Is, is that yeah. kind of what the uh, research points to? Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can also see like uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans was a really prominent example of that, of uh, the uh, socioeconomic classes that were harshly affected and had no way to recover versus um, the ones that had the ability to recover but were not very uh, much affected. Uh, um, and yeah, and then Houston, Houston as well. Um, another thing that um, our data showed is uh, increased risk actually due to dams. Um, and so all these dams going up and people feel safe um, and right. sure it's relatively rare that it collapses or overtops, but when, it's, when it does, it's devastating because people move to this place because they think it's safe, um, even though it's directly in the way. Um, so that, well, that's, that's, people refer to this as the Olivia effect, which is still somewhat debated, um, but we've definitely, uh, seen that pattern in real data. The what factor? I missed the word. Uh, the levy effect. 
um, where people feel yeah, yeah, sure. by, yeah, by infrastructure that <laughs> then fails and those can be uh, that much more devastating. Well, that takes us right back to Manu, who's, who's done extensive work on that very point. And, um, and, and again, it's the time scale issue. This gets back to the core point we're all exploring here, I think, which is uh, extreme events by definition are rare, right? That that's if they were not ex rare, they would not be extreme. <laughs> so it's like, and rarity leads to a disconnection from political urgency. And we build and build and build, settle, 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 and the rare thing happens. Uh, the, those odds are changing because of climate change, but that paper, a recent paper out of uh, Vienna uh, showed clearly these these monsters are, are there waiting. Um, so Manu, you've dealt with this for decades, right? And, and at various scales, from the scale of small communities to the scale of global policy. Are we inching toward progress here in dealing with in normalizing a way to have rare extreme events integrated into planning? You know, all the things that our guests are saying here should give me hope. But unfortunately, I think they verge more on the side of rhetoric and demand for these things than actual actions. Uh, it's been known since perhaps the 1960s that with regard to disasters, which uh, correspond to extreme events, a dollar invested in prevention is worth two dollars or more. You know, that's the colloquial saying in uh, costs incurred post-disaster, it hasn't changed the dynamic in terms of in those investments. Uh, further, you know, with this issue of marginal populations and so forth, it's interesting in the United States, whether it is privately funded or publicly funded projects, we have this concept of benefit cost analysis uh, for any investment that we do, whether it's green infrastructure or hard infrastructure. And that of course favors higher asset value properties and not lower asset value people. By contrast, Australia has a policy which says everybody gets a hundred year flood protection grant for things that already exist. And where nothing exists right now, you cannot enter the hundred year floodplain, which would fit with what Max is talking about with zoning and protection. Somehow in the politics in the United States and in Europe and in other places, uh, we've become very good at the rhetoric. Uh, it doesn't matter which party is in power, and we have not become very good at acting on these things. And I would put this at the national scale because the local communities, there are actions there. They struggle to figure out how to do it. They just don't have the resources. At the national scale is where we have the averaging and the resources, but it seems impossible to get action. So I'm not optimistic still. Uh, I like every time the rhetoric moves in a positive direction at the national scale, whether it's from the public sector or the private sector, but I'm still not seeing uh, action following that rhetoric. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I have this little shorthand phrase that was first posted on my blog at the New York Times in 2008 by a German reader. He basically said, are we stuck with blah, 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 bang? And I, I've written probably 10 or 15 pieces that have that same phrase. Um, and you always, we always think, well, maybe now, uh, let's say in Germany, there could be a real serious reconsideration of urban design, uh, incorporating what Max and Nature Conservancy and others have long espoused. You know, give the river some space. Uh, we, you know, density matters for for transportation efficiency, for energy efficiency. Get people where they need to be. Uh, and think more seriously about these kinds of uh, realities when you live in a floodplain. So Max, I, I really, I think it's great that you had this report out. W was the phone ringing a lot or the email basket full these past couple of weeks uh, as that report, which had just come out probably, it probably didn't get a lot of attention when it came out, but or maybe it did, but I would imagine maybe now more. You know, I was actually, I was on leave the two weeks after it came out, so I avoided all the phone calls. Um, <laughs> Luckily or unluckily, um, but I, I do think the the point about how we develop our landscapes is really one worth talking about. We again, that's what I said at the beginning. We don't need to think about 
just the area of where people live, but really the whole watershed. And so floods are going to become more frequent and of greater magnitude in many parts of the world. And this is going to become just part of the reality that we have to live with and adapt to. And there's numerous ways in which nature can take a role in, in mitigating that. And as Manu said, a lot of the existing gray infrastructure we have is outdated. And as these floods get larger, they strain that infrastructure more and more and they overtop it more and more. And so one of the examples of a really progressive nature-based solution in, in Europe is called Room for the River. And that's been piloted in the Netherlands. And that was where they've done exactly what you said, Andy. They, they gave some space to the river to just be a river again. So they took down one of the levees or both the levees and they added a bit of space between the natural river and where those levees are. And so this means one, constructing new, new gray infrastructure to accompany that gray, uh, the, the green infrastructure and allowing for just a more natural ecological flow of the river. So adding spaces for flood bypasses, restoring wetlands upstream so that you have this kind of sponging effect of excess water out of the landscape. Right. And as we move forward, a point on urgency, I think in addition to there being too much rhetoric, we also still seem to be caught too much on this era of the pilot project. And one of the key messages of this report is that, hey, we need to move beyond these isolated scattered pilots. There's right. enough literature supporting what we need to do. We need to start working on landscape scale again and bring projects together across the river basin. I mean, when you have nature restored at scale, that's when you really see the benefits, both to people and to the ecosystem. And let's, we're getting toward the end and I really appreciate all your time here. Uh, the, these conversations always lead to more questions and maybe we can reconvene in a couple of months uh, to, to explore. But one of the things that seems to be an opportunity in developed countries, let's just focus on Europe and, and Germany, where I just was reading an article a few months ago about essentially the depopulation crisis in, in Germany and in Japan and other places, there, there are thousands of homes and residential areas that are now empty. People are not living there anymore. So it feels like in areas like that, you have a potential for sort of a grand reconfiguration or grand uh, design to provide the space uh, to, to let go of some land. This is different than in developing countries where, as we just were saying, you know, Africa is going to have probably a, a doubled population by 2050. Uh, it's hard to see that not happening. So maybe just focusing on the mature, these, these, these uh, developed countries, is there an opportunity in, in these areas that are to, to really do that kind of redesign? It feels, it feels like it could be, and maybe uh, Colin too can weigh in on that given your global view of the data. Yeah, is, I mean, from my side, I would, say, I would say from my side, yes, there is. I mean, there's a lot of land use that is compatible with seasonal or, or temporary flooding. So agriculture, depending on the crop, can be compatible with temporary flooding. And we then need to look at the question of what type of development are we doing on this less used land? Are we developing impervious structures, so places where the, the water can't penetrate into the soil anymore? Or are we having some kind of mixed use where there's still space for the water to be absorbed and captured, maybe reinfiltrated to the groundwater? And yeah, as you said, Europe is very densely populated. We've got these nuclei of, of human settlements. And in between that, there tends to be more space. So I, for the Europe case, I do think there is potential. And part of the problem will be that uh, managed retreat of certain areas which are sitting in floodplains. And so this is probably, unfortunately, going to be a reality for some people, although very difficult one. Yeah. And Simon, I mean, and Colin. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and it's going to be, you know, particularly for the already densely populated places, it's going to be extremely difficult and be very expensive uh, to kind of rearrange um, the current, you know, economic and social structure of a city. Um, uh, whereas, yeah, in the developing um, countries, you might have more opportunity. Um, to get in and uh, do it a little more strategically from the beginning. Um, and I think an important part of 
it as well as uh, just distributing risk. Um, so especially in, uh, you know, alluded to before, like water doesn't see political boundaries. So not just within um, the city itself, but actually distributing risk on a very large scale uh, could, could help um, everyone kind of adapt uh, while um, putting the resources where they need uh, to, to um, increase the infrastructure. Yeah, I, I had, I, sorry. I was going to say on this on this point um, in the developing country context, thinking about um, Europe, but then also you know thinking about the U.S., we we have the tools, right, at the ability to make these sort of changes that are predate right looking at climate change impacts. So you know how do a lot of these infrastructure projects have they always been funded? Um, has been through bonds, right? And we can this is a tried and true way that infrastructure happens um, mm -hmm. and then how do we use that tool that existing tool to fund in right, infrastructure green infrastructure um, projects that will kind of stem a lot of these issues um, you know thinking about opportunities around land trusts right so many land trusts again um, have having started and predated um, in the in the 70s and the 80s you know these are tools that can be can be available um, and then some of the things that cities are doing you know so on, on the one hand, tale of two cities, right? We have research that shows us that cities only have control over about 4% um, of, of the city itself, right? Everything else is sort of through um, policy and directives, but of what they do control, I mean, building codes, right? Looking at where development happens. Um, city of Portland, you know, has a had a, Per perimeter around the ability of like how much further can you go? Um, city of Minneapolis made changes so that you can't have the same growth of single family homes, right? That it has to be infill within the city. So we have all of these. Uh, I want to offer that we were talking earlier, Amanu, about the the optimism, but I'm I'm thinking really around like what tools and resources do we have available that really those muscles need to be better flexed and, and utilized. Yeah, I'm showing a picture here of uh, in 2009. I was in Seoul. Uh, South Korea for a meeting, and I was I used the opportunity to write an article about the uh, the daylighting of uh, the uh, Chungichan, which was the tiny stream that Seoul had evolved around a thousand years ago and had been paved over. And uh, you know they created a floodable, a more floodable, cooler corridor there that became uh, popular with a uh, lunchtime crowd and and the like. And I also at the same time Yonkers here in the United States. Uh, the Sawmill River, let me see if I can make this picture come back. My computer's a little slow. Oh, just went away. The, the Sawmill River we, had gone under the city of Yonkers for since the 20s, and then it had come back. They, they've stripped it away. So that seemed like a possibility that feels exciting, that you can, you can do this. V Vancouver, I think, is also uh, daylighting a lot of its streams. Vancouver had thousands of little trout stream, you know, salmon streams and stuff through it. And I do, the one last thing I want to bring up here is that sort of a north-south dialogue is really helpful, I think, sometimes. I noticed, um, I'll show this tweet in a second, Salim, Salim Haq at the IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development, I think, had tweeted um, during Europe's flooding, he said, you know, we have some lessons for you. <laughs> we can help you. Um, let me show you that because it's, I think it makes the point better than my, I can. He noted here that, you know, Bangladesh, for example, has been adapting to floods and they've had a dramatic de reduction in, in mortality and from flooding in Bangladesh the last 30, 40 years because they've gotten better responsive systems for getting people out of harm's way. They have platforms and like, and he, his point was, uh, we, we can help Germany figure out some some ways forward here, perhaps. So, how important is is global dialogue here? And uh, I think that's part of what CD, CDP is trying to do. So we we go through the same questionnaire process that that cities are responding to globally, no matter where they are. So German German cities, um, Bangladeshi cities are going through the reporting process to the similar questionnaire. And what is that? 
you know, illuminate, what does that bring forward? Daylight is about 3,000 actions that cities are taking across the globe. Um, we provide that data, make it available to cities themselves. We provide them with resources and snapshots and actually consultation support of, you know, gaps that we see, risks that they haven't considered. Um, that all happens by way of feedback from the disclosure process. And a lot of that is also then informed by best practices that we see from other cities. Um, and we build on that by way of workshops and webinars um, and best practice exchanges. We work within um, a network of organizations that are really focused and dedicated on working at this intersection of, of city and climate action. Um, and so have a, a variety of global partners as well that kind of help us do this work. That's great. Well, let's, I'm, I'm going to close out with one last reminder on the urgency factor. And we I mentioned earlier this paper uh, from last year. It's just one of many in this field of, if you Google for the word paleo flood is one word, paleo flood, there's a body of work that shows in a very scary way that as this paper says, you know, we are in a new era, a flood rich period. Uh, it's exceptional within the past 500 years. The exceptional nature of it is mainly in the fact that it's more in a different season. It's, it's, it seems to be the flooding coming more in warm months like we see now. In, in these past eras of hyper flood uh, and the, it's been cooler. But here is just a, I just want to show you an animation from the paper because it gets this, uh, this issue pretty clear. Um, this is a scale from top to bottom from now, which is that's, this is this flood rich period for Europe right now. And you can, it's laid over the map. And then here in the uh, 1850s, the, around 1800, 1700, 1650, back to the Middle Ages, Europe has had these patterns. And this is, again, I can tell you from work I've done on flood history in the United States, this is something we have to deal with, period. So anyone out there who's thinking, oh, this is just those global warming alarmists, is missing that the risk issue, the, the, the hazard is there. And it's being exacerbated in ways that are clear cut uh, through warming. But I think the more this gets integrated into conversations, maybe the better, the more likely, the, let's say the financial community, which has a green component, as you've been saying, but it also has a very kind of non-green component <laughs> where the green is more about money still than about climate. And this says to me, watch out. And Manu, yeah, I'd like to have you just offer maybe one more perspective on that too. And just be, before you do, I just want to show, um, I think I had it here. I did one of the, the stories I did in 2002 on a nature paper on flood patterns in the US Northeast found that we are in an era of rising floodiness, floodiness in the Northeast, but there've been through the last thousands of years episodes of flooding, and this is in the, the, the beds of lakes, you can see gravel that got scoured off of the hills over thousands of years. And the pattern shows that it's unbelievable what's in the system waiting to happen. Uh, this was a 1927 flood in Vermont where um, a fading tropical system came ashore. And, and Paul Bierman at the University of Vermont said that the record that this left in the lake bed is small compared to some of these other incidents. So this is Vermont uh, in November of 1927. And it, the Lieutenant Governor died, uh, much of the agriculture was destroyed. So they're there, they're baked in, uh, and we're exacerbating this now, uh, loading the dice as James Hansen said so long ago. And Manu, uh, you know, maybe, are we at a moment when that inertia you have faced it can really tip. Well, I would like to end on an optimistic note, right? Uh, it's not always easy to do that. So integrating in a couple of the conversations and your example about Bangladesh and, you know, the Dutch are marketing themselves as flood fighters as well, and that the world should learn from them on how to deal with floods. So what's common about Bangladesh and Holland is that these are places that are perpetually flooded. Every single year they have significant flooding. Mm. Um, so they, you know, devise some things to deal with that. And the challenge for the rest of the world is that these are not happening all the time. So the fact that they happen only infrequently, uh, then they say, okay, well, this was a disaster and a presidential declaration will pay for it. And I don't need to do it. 
damn thing, right? So that's kind of the dynamic that we are dealing with. So I think as we move into more flood prone periods, because we have those in the period record and in the historical record, maybe the awareness and what to do about it will change. I could say the same about drought, but we are seeing that the dynamic is very slow in terms of social change towards drought. Um, I'm going to give you a story which, uh, so in the late 90s, Al Gore was vice president and his office contacted me and they wanted me to see what I could do about explaining what was going on with Devil's Lake, North Dakota. This was flooding, the lake was rising uh, and continued to rise year after year. And it was really, you know, if you looked at the data from 1940 onwards, which is what was publicly available, it was just unreal. Uh, the lake does, you know, something like this the whole time, and then it goes there, and, and it's just continuing to go up. And at some point, it spills. It is no longer a closed basin lake. So uh, Al Gore's idea was, uh, here's an academic. He'll, he'll tell us that this is due to climate change. And then, you know, I can build a story around that. Well, we looked at Pedro data, and it seemed like every 150 years or so, this lake does exactly that. Uh, and this is what people have found with the arc storm scenario in California. Every 250 years or so, you get these atmospheric rivers that just come and come and come and dump all over the place. Well, so we presented this and we said, okay, since this happens all the time, every few hundred, uh, every 150 years or so, one needs to think about the mechanics and one needs to think about predicting it and one needs to think about what to do about it. Uh, Vice President Gore went out and gave a talk saying, this is all due to climate change anyway. It didn't matter. <laughs> so I think the, the, the problem that I have is that once these things are in the political eye, they end up taking the political viewpoint rather than the scientific viewpoint. And the opportunity that we have to capitalize on, which I've learned much later, is once they are in the political viewpoint, it doesn't matter what the politician is saying. You need to pile on. and push for the things that need to be acted upon. And that's something that I personally missed out on doing. And I think, you know, as these things develop as a community, what we need to, as a scientific community and an NGO community and so forth, what we need to do is articulate very clearly what we would like to see happen, rather than we are having this disaster and it is due to climate change. Because the saying that really is not helping the situation. I'm sorry. I was just trying to show something there about the arc storm flood. Uh, the the yeah, my book, my 2018 book, uh, had Lynn Ingram from Berkeley talking about that flood that made the whole central valley of California was a lake for a while, 1861, 62. And I still think it's early days to think about how we get. I, I don't think you could ever integrate that into a mitigation scenario very ac actively because it's if it's on that time scale. But you certainly awareness of it. And the reality that it's there and it's something that comes can then hopefully change some 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 factors. It looks like you're all dug in in the way that that Manu uh, described. I'm really glad to have Katie Walsh and Max Ricker from the Nature Conservancy, Katie from CDP, Colin Doyle from Cloud to Street. Good luck with your your work, and Manu from Columbia Water uh, Water Center and the Columbia Climate School here today to try to. Um, point everyone toward a rational approach and recognizing the political realities are always going to be there. You know, that, that, that what was just described there about former vice president Al Gore is going on in Germany too, where it, you know, everyone says, Oh, climate change. And that, that's fine. It's in the system. But if it takes you away from action on the ground too, then that would be a shame. It was good to see even uh, uh, the Friends of the Earth was making this point uh, the other day. The catastrophic consequences of the heavy rain are partly homemade, said Holger uh, Richter. Um, so let's keep at this. I think making these points can't hurt. City, as, as Katie said, you, you, when you measure something, at the very least, you're on the hook for if it's you're not hitting your marks. And uh, there's lots of work to do going ahead. And thank you for being part of this uh, Sustain What conversation today. Uh, I'll post some summaries of it on my uh, my new column at revkin.bulletin.com, which is just launched yesterday. And of course, these videos can be shared wherever you're watching. It gets archived right away and is shareable and postable. And thanks again, and be well. Stay safe. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.